Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to our time of worship and prayer this morning. Before we begin, we want to, um, first of all, welcome you if you're a visitor and to fill out some visitor cards, which should be in your pew in front of you. And you can place those in the offering plate as it passes by. We also wanted to acknowledge the uh, falling COVID numbers and our board decided that there would be a certain number that once the, uh, once the numbers fell, the COVID numbers fell below that number, we would relax the guidelines. And as you probably have noticed, we have uh, dropped below that. So we're very, very grateful for the relaxed protocol. We also want to continue uh, to encourage everyone to be updated uh, on their vaccinations and, um, and precautions in that, in that way. But also we want this to be a place where you still feel comfortable and encouraged to wear a mask if you feel inclined. So uh, please continue to do so if, if that's you, um, but also take advantage of the relaxed mandates um, if, if you feel that's also something that would be healthy and good for you. So we're, we're grateful for those, those numbers and being able to come into worship together in, in the ways that we can. So as we gather in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, let us stand together, um, open up our bulletins, and join our voices in song with the call to worship, Holy Ground. We'll go immediately from Holy Ground to our first hymn, which is, O Worship the King, number 29 in your hymnals. This is holy ground, we're standing on a holy ground, for the Lord is present and where he is is holy. This is holy ground, we're standing Whose robe is the light 
whose kind of peace space in seeds of wrath the deep thunder clouds form and dark is his path on the wings and the storm thy bountiful care what tongue can recite it breathes in the air it shines in the light it streams from the hill it descends to the plain and sweetly distills in the dew and the rain frail children of dust and feeble as frail in thee do we trust nor find thee to fail thy mercies how tender how firm to the end our maker defender redeemer and friend as we enter into our time of worship let's go into a time of confession and you will follow along with the response of the confession as printed in your bulletin. Let's pray. Have mercy on us, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out our transgressions. Wash us thoroughly from our iniquity and cleanse us from our sin. For we know our transgressions, and our sin is ever before us. Against you, you alone have we sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified in your sentence and blameless when you pass judgment. Wash us thoroughly from our iniquity and cleanse us from our sin. Almighty God, have mercy on us and forgive us all our sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen us in all goodness and by the power of your Holy Spirit, keep us in eternal life. As water is emptied out into this basin, so too your life through Christ was emptied out in a perfect offering of love and praise back to you. And we pray, O oh Lord, that in Christ's sacrifice, your spirit would wash us and make us clean, as well as unite us to a body that empties and is filled by your Holy Spirit. We pray this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Our first lesson this morning comes from Isaiah chapter 55. Ho, oh, everyone who thirst, come to the waters. And you that have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me, and eat what is good, and delight yourself in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen, so that you may live. I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. See, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and a commander for the peoples. See, you shall call nations that you do not know, and nations that do not know you shall run to you because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Seek the Lord while he may be found. 
Call upon him while he is near. Let let the wicked forsake their way and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them return to the Lord that he may have mercy on them and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now let us read our psalm responsively. You'll see the psalm printed in the bulletin. Psalm 63. O God, you are my God. I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you, as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory. Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. I will lift up my hands and call on your name. My soul is satisfied as with a rich feast, and my mouth praises you with joyful lips when I think of you on my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night. For you have been my help, and in the shadow of your wings I will sing for joy. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. Our second lesson comes from 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized in, uh, into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them, and they were struck down in the wilderness. Now these things occurred as examples for us, so that we may not desire evil as they did. Do not become idolaters as some of them did, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink, and they rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality, as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test, as some of them did, and were destroyed by serpents. And do not complain, as some of them did, and were destroyed by the destroyer. These things happened to them to serve as an example, and they were written down to instruct us upon whom the end of the ages have come. So if you think you were standing, watch out that you do not fall. No testing has overtaken you that is not common to everyone. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tested beyond your strength. But with the testing, he will provide the way out so that you will be able to endure it. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our hymn, Come to the Water, you'll find in your order of worship. Oh, let 
continuing to pray and worship. Uh, we come to God with thanksgivings and also petitions. So what thanksgivings and petitions would you like to name before the body this morning? Yes, Ephraim. Who all is going? Okay, to Honduras. Brian. Some of you guys uh, know my sister Kristen. Her and her husband Dave have decided to join a missions organization in Florida. Um, and I'll be sending out an email at the top of the list. Uh, to pray for them as they move to Florida this summer. Tim. 
learned this morning that uh, Jim has set the memorial. Jim Street has set the memorial for Linda for April the 16th okay. in Atlanta. And I tell you the name of the church, but it escapes me at the moment. Linda Street, Jim's uh, wife who passed away earlier this year, um, having a memorial service. You said April the 16th. April the 16th. Okay. Jay. Uh, continue to pray for Jim Hofford, who's recovering from uh, surgery. It will be a few more weeks of recovery, but we give thanks for where he's at right now. Pray for my, my husband, Nate. Yes, and Nate Wenzel recovering from, from health problems as well as trying to figure out uh, future stability with that, yeah. We also continue, uh, just to name some other people within our family, continue to remember Debbie Shields, um, Linda Yarwood, uh, also um, the, uh, Katie, Siebenaller, Katie, Katie Banks' uh, grandfather, Larry Siebenaller, and her aunt, Shelley Cohen. Um, also, uh, I believe, uh, Ray, um, Ray Lyons mentioned uh, an acquaintance of his in an email, Lucas McKinney and his family. Uh, Lucas uh, suffered or uh, had an accident and, and died earlier this week. So we pray for Ray and, and also for, for all of the people affected by that. Let's, oh, Rosemary? Oh, and Gracie Knowles. I have her on the list. Thank you. I absolutely have her here. Um, thank you. Yeah, we continue to lift Gracie Knowles up in our prayer as well. Let's go to God in prayer and approach this time with reverent silence. O oh God, you are our God. We seek you. Our souls thirst for you. Our flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. We gather here in the name of Jesus to look upon you in the sanctuary, to behold you and your power and your glory because of your steadfast love, your love, O oh Lord, is better than life, and our lips will sing your praise. We give you praise for being a God who is not far off, but a God who is near. As we mention all of the things that hinder us, the things that weigh us down, as we name the brokenness in our own lives, and in the lives of our loved ones, we sing your praise because you are a God who chose to unite yourself, not only to our humanity, but also to our brokenness, in order to pour out your unending life of love and healing and presence. And for this, we cannot help but to sing your praise and to give you Thanks for being with us, for being present here. We give you thanks for being a God who continues to shower us with love and grace. Even after we sin and turn away from you, clinging to things that do not bring life but bring death, contributing to the brokenness of the world, you still speak to us, and for this, we give you thanks and praise. We give you thanks for speaking to us through creation. We give you thanks for speaking to us through your holy word. We give you thanks for speaking to us through the sacraments of communion. We give you thanks for being present to us through friends, through loved ones, through people and their acts of kindness, their acts of generosity, their acts of patience, their acts of goodness and faithfulness. 
and for these gifts that have flown in, that have flowed into our lives we praise you and we thank you and we give you thanks for being a god who hears our prayers as we thirst for you and we cry out for you to fill us up we cry out on behalf of our friends our families our loved ones who are in need of your healing touch, your saving embrace, and we pray for healing. We pray for a deeper and profound sense of your presence and your love in the lives of those we named. For the McKinney family, for the Yarwood family, for the Shields family, for the Winsel family, for the Knowles family, for the Hawford family, for the Siebenhaller family, and for those people and concerns we hold dear to our hearts but have not named, we pause and lift them up before you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer and let our cry come to you. We pray also for a blessing upon this congregation, upon our individual lives and vocations as we continue through our own presence, our own work, our own crafts, that we might in some way further your kingdom. We cannot do this on our own and by our own power, but only with your blessing. Transform the works of our hands, the words of our mouths, to become your work and your words in our week before us. We also pray for blessing upon the upcoming travels of Ephraim and his colleagues as they go to a mission in Honduras. We pray for your blessing of wisdom and discernment on Brian's sister, Kristen, as she also transitions to a new work and new life. We also pray for a blessing upon Jim Street in this memorial service that's coming up. And we also give you thanks for the memorial service that the Shields were able to have this week with Robert. Thank you for blessing them and continuing to bless their lives. And we also pray for continued healing, not only with Rosemary, but also as they suffer uh, and continue to recover from the loss of Robert. Guide us and direct us, O oh Lord, for your ways are not our ways, nor your thoughts our thoughts. And so with faith, we continue this journey of Lent and this journey of life, seeking to please you and seeking to draw closer to you. Increase our faith and increase our love as you draw us closer to yourself and continue to bless us with wisdom and love. We pray all of these things through Christ our Lord who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. If you're willing, would you please stand for the reading of the gospel? The Holy Gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Luke. Glory be to you. O Lord. At that very time, there were some present who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. He asked them, Do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way, they were worse sinners than all the other Galileans? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all perish as they did. Or those 18 who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think that they were worse offenders 
than all the others living in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish just as they did. Then he told them this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it and found none. So he said to the gardener, See here, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree, and still I find none. Cut it down. Why should it be wasting the soil? He replied, Sir, let it alone for one more year until I dig around it and put manure on it. If it bears fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. The Holy Gospel, praise to you, O Christ, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please sit. Our communion hymn you'll find in our order of worship this morning, Gift of Finest Wheat. You satisfy the hungry heart with gifts of finest wheat. Come give to us, O saving Lord, the bread of life to eat. As when the shepherd calls his sheep, they know and heed his voice. So when you call your family, Lord, we follow and rejoice. You satisfy the hungry heart with gifts of finest wheat. Come give to us, O saving Lord, the bread of life to heat. With joyful lips we sing to you our praise and gratitude that you should count us worthy, Lord, to share this heavenly food. You satisfy the hungry heart with gifts of finest wheat. Come give to us, O saving Lord, the bread of life to heat. Is not the cup we bless and share, the blood of Christ outpoured? Do not one cup, one loaf declare our ownness in the Lord. You satisfy the hungry heart with gifts of finest wheat. Come give to us, O saving Lord, the bread of life to heat. The mystery of your presence, Lord, no mortal tongue can tell, whom all the world cannot contain, comes in our hearts to dwell. You satisfy the hungry heart with gift of finest wheat. Come give to us, O saving Lord, the bread of life to be. You give yourself to us, O Lord, and send us let us.
In these scripture passages, we see images of God as a giver of life, the water of life found in a desert stone, the glory of the world, and as a gardener who gives second chances. Many of us come to this table bearing burdens. The past two years have been, for many of us, an incredibly dry place. We have lost parents, spouses, children, friends, and opportunities. Even the joy of gathering together and seeing each other's faces has become foreign to us. Every time we gather at this table, it is an opportunity to share our burdens with everyone else at the table. This is how we stay flexible, green, and growing instead of hardening like the dry ground around us. Let us help each other see the good in ourselves and in each other fertilizing the soil around each of our lives. Let the fruit of our lives nourish each other, just as the meal we receive while gathered at this table nourishes us spiritually. May God gently weed out treachery, gluttony, greed, and fear, so that the fruit of kindness, grace, peace, goodness, and joy grow in our lives instead. May that fruit flow to all who have labored without satisfaction, and may goodness follow us all of our days. As we come to this table, thirsty for the water of life, may God grant us refreshed work, families, communities, and hearts. And as we share the bread on this table, we pray that God's glory will be shown just as it was on the night when Jesus was betrayed. On that night, he took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after, also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us pray. O oh God, we thank you for the gifts of life that you bring to us this day and every day. We pray that you would bless our hearts and bless our lives as we spread your love throughout the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The gifts of God for the people of God. Take and eat.
We give of our lives in ways we realize and in ways we may never know. May the goodness of God grow in our hearts, and may God help abundant life grow even in dry places. Our theme for this third Sunday in Lent is God fills our cups in times of drought. On Ash Wednesday, Tim invited us to consider what we were carrying into the Lenten season. Fatigue from COVID, anxiety over work or finances, fear, addiction, to cup these things in our hands and pour them out to God. I'd like to begin with a similar invitation. Bring to mind something in your life right now that feels dried up, something that is languishing or feels fruitless. Personally, in the church, in the world, it could be a relationship, a job situation, Anxiety over war, conflict, climate change. Simply cup your hand and hold on to that for a moment. We'll return to it later. 
We often talk about our Lenten journey as a desert or a wilderness, reflecting the 40-day wilderness Jesus walked after his baptism. This Lent, my mind has turned to actual deserts and what can survive or even flourish in them. The Chihuahuan Desert, home of Big Bend National Park, is on my list of places to visit. Spanning northern Mexico and the southwestern United States, it's the largest desert in North America. And like most deserts, it's a place for slow growth. Growth so slow, it's almost imperceptible. This desert is also home to a plant called Solanginella lepidophilia, the resurrection plant, or resurrection fern. During times of drought, the resurrection fern rolls itself up into a dry, crispy brown ball, looking like tiny tumbleweed, and goes dormant. It can survive for years without water. No death, no growth either, just dormancy. Here is one description of it. No matter how dry or damaged it becomes, because of the particular biological structure of its leaves, this plant retains the ability to imbibe water and unfold itself, even many years after its death. Literally, a resurrection plant. I recently discovered the resurrection fern while Googling plants you cannot destroy, as <laughs> we all do from time to time. <laughs> a few days later, what looks like a fistful of dried twigs and dead roots showed up in a plastic bag in my mailbox a dead resurrection fern that the package promised I could bring back to life with just a little bit of water. It did not look promising. <laughs> As it has set in a cup of water over the past week in my kitchen, I have watched its clenched fist open, its tendrils begin to green and unfurl. It is amazing what a little water can do transforming twiggy tumbleweed into a green and growing plant in the span of a few days. This transformation hasn't happened overnight, of course, but slowly, day by day, it changes from a dusty root ball into a green and lacy fern. I imagine the fig tree in Jesus' parable this morning looked about as unpromising as the fisted clump of dried leaves that arrived in my mailbox last week. Probably a little twiggy, not very green. Interestingly, this week's Old Testament readings are filled with images of God's provision and loving kindness flowing out like water and wine for parched souls. Let everyone who thirsts come to the waters. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price, invites Isaiah. Psalm 63 begins with the psalmist's parched lips longing for God, and then moves to those same lips, offering praise to God. While these readings are filled to the brim with flourishing, our gospel reading paints images of harshness and drought, both physical and metaphorical. Luke's passage begins with Jesus and his followers puzzling over the mystery of tragedy and suffering, both at the hands of tyrants and at the hands of freak accidents. In a display of violent power, Pilate has killed Galileans who were worshiping at the temple, mingling their own blood with the blood of their sacrifices. In a random accident, 18 people are crushed under the Tower of Siloam as it falls. As we do when witnessing or experiencing tragedy, those around Jesus wonder, why this? Why us? Or maybe, why them and not us? Jesus knows what they are thinking. Is it because they are somehow worse sinners? Did they somehow deserve this suffering and we don't? And if so, does that mean the suffering won't come to us if we're just good people, if we're just good enough? Jesus' answer begins well. No, I tell you, they did not suffer because they were worse sinners. This is not what God, God's judgment looks like. Yes, I can get on board with this answer. But then Jesus takes a sharp turn. But unless you repent, you will all perish just as they did. Not a comforting follow-up, Jesus. The parable that follows is similarly stark. 
Something, a physical drought, a drought of care and attention, has kept one of the landowner's fig trees from bearing fruit. Impatient with this lack of fruitfulness, the landowner is eager to cut it down and start all over again. His call sounds a familiar theme throughout Luke, extending John the Baptist's warning earlier in Luke 3. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the tree. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown in the fire. Harsh? Maybe. But also all part of a day's work for a farmer who has to make hard calculations about how to use land best. This parable is, at its most basic level, a parable about growth and change. In other words, about repentance. Repentance is not just an exhortation to be better. It's a deep acknowledgement that we often don't live our lives as if we were living in God's kingdom of truth and beauty, justice, mercy, and love. Repentance is a summons to step out of the destructive and violent ways of Pilate and other tyrants, which are hidden possibilities in all of our hearts. It's a hard call that our lives should bear fruit, the fruit of turning toward God and God's ways. But while hard, repentance is also a hopeful and perhaps even joyful move. Frederick Buechner describes repentance as coming to our senses. True repentance, he writes, spends less time looking at the past and saying, I'm sorry, than than looking to the future and saying, wow. Repentance, in other words, is less about dwelling on what we have done wrong and more about joining in with what God is making right in the world. But if we broaden our scope beyond the parable to its context, this parable of repentance is also about how we live in times of drought, both literal and metaphorical, when what has nourished and sustained us seems like it's drying up fast. Jesus' parable is told to disciples who are not just asking abstract philosophical questions about tragedy and suffering. It is possible, and maybe even probable, that some of the Galileans they asked Jesus about are acquaintances, friends, maybe even people they love. They are facing not just hard questions, but hard realities, wondering if they and their families will be the next catastrophic headline. Their unspoken question to Jesus is, what do we do? Jesus' answer turns their gaze away from the realities of the suffering they can't change or explain and turns them towards what they can change, their own hearts and minds. Situations of suffering and drought hold many possibilities, and drought can take many forms. Whether it be a long spiritual drought, a drought of interest in what once brought us joy, a lost relationship or job, perhaps a pandemic in which we have longed for community like water. The temptation in these situations is to close up like that dried fist of twigs that showed up in my mailbox. We isolate ourselves, afraid to invite others into the deserts that we walk. Times of drought also tempt us to become dormant, not exactly dead, but not growing either. We are paralyzed by uncertainty, unsure how and where to act. This is where Jesus' invitation to repentance meets us. Instead of answering their pressing questions about tragedy and suffering, Jesus invites his followers to change. Jesus sees within our times of drought the possibility of transformation. And he gives us something to do when drought begins to paralyze us. Tend to the growth that we can. This week, we continued to witness the rubble of a senseless war in Ukraine. Russia, using military tactics I thought died with the Middle Ages, has besieged cities, forcing entire populations into submission through violence, 
cutting citizens off from access to water, food, power. Particularly horrifying has been the siege on Mariupol, near the Russian border, where Russia bombed a maternity clinic and a theater civilians were using as a shelter. A haunting report from two Associated Press journalists working in Mariupol began. The bodies of the children all lie here, dumped into this narrow trench, hastily dug into the frozen earth of Mariupol to the constant drumbeat of shelling. As water lines have burst and dried up, citizens have melted snow to drink. This is a drought that I, like the disciples, want to bring to Jesus and ask, why? What judgment is this? As I hear voices on the radio speculate about another world war, I feel myself closing up, beginning to become dormant. But Jesus' words of repentance shock me out of dormancy. Despite the fruitless products of violence and hatred, God is growing good fruits of repentance. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, gentleness, self-control. When we witness the lack of these in our world, our job is not to become paralyzed in tragedy, but to make sure that our own lives are fertile ground in which these fruits can grow and begin to extend to others. Jesus' call to repentance urges us to take a look at what our lives are growing or failing to grow. Instead of answering all our questions about tragedy and suffering, Jesus gives us a new set of questions to ask about goodness and its possibilities. What in our lives is rooted in the same myopic ambition or desire for control that leads a tyrant to attack others? What in our lives keeps us nursing a grudge so long that we would wound or destroy another's life to make it right. And this just isn't just an individual call to repentance. It's a communal one. What in our churches keeps us from bearing the good fruits of repentance? Where in our churches can we cultivate more love, more goodness, more gentleness toward others, especially to those who have not often experienced those fruits from the church? Where can we more fully live into God's vision of the fruiting and flourishing of all creation? Lest we become too discouraged by our own fruitlessness or focus too much on our own efforts at being good, let's return to my favorite character in Jesus' parable, the gardener. When the impatient landowner is ready to chop down the fruitless fig tree, the gardener says, wait, just one more year. Give me one more year to pile on as much nourishment as I can before you give up on this tree. This one more year could be read in a couple different ways. A foreboding prediction, an urgent summons to turn or burn as fast as you can. But from the perspective of the gardener, someone who depends on trees to produce fruit, this one more year comes across as a grace, a little extra time, a lot more nourishment. This gardener knows that fig trees can take a few years to begin fruiting. She is patient. She knows that sometimes fruit is being formed beyond what we can see. Making one-to-one -one comparisons in parables is dangerous work sometimes. And one of the beauties of parables is that they open themselves up to multiple meanings. But imagine this reading with me. God is, as always, since the very beginning of creation, the patient gardener. God extends the grace of time to those who worry about our fruit production. God is constantly, ceaselessly piling nourishment around our fruitless roots. Even when we don't see much that is promising, even when our lives, our churches, our world look like dried up tumbleweed, 
God pours on the water. And when this water hits our roots, that which was closed begins to open. That which was dried up begins to green. And the Spirit slowly unfurls our lives, extending them to others. Let's return for a minute to to whatever it is that you were holding at the beginning of the sermon. Whatever feels like drought in your life or the life of the world. Whatever is languishing, lacking fruit or nourishment. Cup it in your hand again. You can close your eyes if that helps. Now imagine God, the patient and faithful gardener, watering steadily. What might water, even in small amounts, look like for this dried up plant? Where might it come from? What would it look like for these dried up twigs to begin to green and unfurl? Now offer a prayer for water, trusting that God continues to pour it out into our hands, preparing us for resurrection. Here's the thing about drought. Even a little bit of water can help. One guide to helping trees recover from drought reads, it's impractical to impractical to adequately water the entire root zone. To do so would require thousands of gallons of water. Fortunately, wetting even a small portion of a tree's root zone will greatly help reduce drought stress. And here's another piece of good news. The tree image that we find in today's gospel reading is used often in scripture not to represent individuals, but whole communities, the people of Israel, the church, So water flowing in one part of the tree nourishes us all. So search for the water if you have to. Dig your roots deep. Be surprised by the nourishment of God, even in times of drought. For with God, there is an abundance of water. And then be transformed into trees that grow the fruits of repentance, fruits to be shared, at the great banquet Isaiah describes, where those who thirst find water and those who hunger find nourishment. Amen. Our closing hymn today will be hymn 78, O God, Our Help in Ages Past. If you'll please stand while we sing.
Thanks, Laura, for bringing the word to us today. Let me share just a few announcements with you before we take off today. Um, pick up a church directory if you haven't already done so. There should be some on the tables just as you're departing the sanctuary on the left or on the right. This week we have um, a meal that's going to be happening just after this service for those who are uh, working on the bylaws. So uh, don't forget to stick around for that if you're on that team. At the Wednesday table this week, I think it's enchiladas. And if you're planning to come and you haven't let Mary know, her address is in uh, the uh, bulletin, and you can give her a, a number on how many people will be coming for that. On Thursday, a couple of things are happening. Emmanuel is having a lectureship on preaching, and uh, there are three different slots that are uh, appointed for that. There's a, uh, a professor is coming, I believe he's Ugandan, is that right, Gary? Yes. Um, and uh, he's going to be talking about the gift of reconciliation on Thursday. Also on Thursday, um, we have an outreach meeting in the evening. So if you're on that team, uh, take, take note of that. Then next Saturday, the Creation Care Ministry team is going to be planting some trees around the church. So uh, if you've been inspired by uh, the sermon today, come and help plant some of those trees. Are there other announcements that need to be made? Benjamin. So I have a few youth announcements, and then I'll transition to other announcements. But So uh, we have Sunshiners beginning uh, to... Next Sunday. For the time being, we'll meet in the fellowship hall. Um, if you ever let me know, it would be helpful if you would email me with your child's name and age and any information I might not have about you. Email. Great. So be sure to text Rosemary. Uh, oh, oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> sorry email. <laughs> uh, so that's next Sunday. Um, this Sunday, uh, we're having a baptism class starting uh, this Sunday from 5 to 6. So if you, we, we're opening this up for elementary age kids. Um, whether or not they're planning on baptism or not, uh, feel free to send them to this. It'll be just a, a basic general uh, baptism class, and that will go from 5 to 6. Uh, the rest of the season of Lent, and hopefully we can look at some baptisms in the Easter season. Um, also, uh, there's a small youth group change, the 6th through 12th grade. Um, we'll, uh, we were going to open up and have a congregation-wide worship service. This Wednesday, we're moving that to March 30th, the last Wednesday of this month. So I'll send out an email about that. But So in two weeks, we invite you all to join us after Wednesday table for uh, just a, a corporate worship time together, both all, all groups involved. So that's gonna be in two weeks. Put it on your calendar. We'd love for you all to join us. This Friday, the sixth through 12th grade are gonna do kind of a girls night out, guys night out. We're gonna meet here at 6.30 from 6.30 to nine. Uh, we'll eat together and then we'll split up into groups. So that's this coming up Friday from 6.30 to nine. Um, there's one other thing. Uh, oh, and then there's in between the soul crafts, there's no, not going to be a regular uh, 6th to 12th grade meeting for uh, the Sunday evenings. But I am going to send out an email and text to you all uh, to just get that all clear, but just wanted to kind of get the lay of the land right now. Uh, then to transition, we want to give thanks to all of you who participated and led in the soul crafts. Um, this Sunday night, or tonight at four to five, we're meeting with some of the leaders and anybody who's interested in future soul crafts, um, we're going to talk about how it went as well as what uh, some future ones might look like. Um, so if you want to make some suggestions to me about a particular class or interest group um, that you'd be interested in joining or leading, just let me know. Uh, and again, we're going to be talking about logistics um, tonight from four to five. But thank you. It was, it was great. And the format of that, we're going to kind of keep of just uh, four week little intervals. So you're not signing up from here to eternity, but just a beginning and end time. Uh, it went really, really well. We really enjoyed the kind of multi-generational meetings, uh, as well as a little bit of a freedom to choose what interests you the most. I think 
that is all I have. So thanks for your participation this far. Um, and again, email me if you have any questions uh, or suggestions about soul crafts. I'll send an email out to all the parents um, just to clarify the upcoming events with the youth. Thanks. All right. Let's pray together, shall we? Lord, we open our branches and roots to the nourishing rain that, that falls from you. And we ask, oh God, that you'd bring life to our dry and thirsty souls. We pray that, O oh Lord, for ourselves, and we also pray it, Lord, for the good of the kingdom. Help us to bear rich fruit for you. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's sing together our dismissal chorus. in you uh, be brought back to amazing life in this week in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Go in peace. Amen.